um, so I am Dina, Dina Fonseca. I am the, the director of the Center of Vector Biology. I mostly am a, bi a mosquito person, but I, a few years back, started working on ticks. And, and now, it really because of you, the residents of New Jersey, that I've started working on basically anything that can transmit blood, oh sorry, can, trans can bite and, and get blood and transmit pathogens. And even sometimes working on things that just basically a nuisance. Uh, because in fact, most people when asked if you'd rather get rid of mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus or mosquitoes that uh, prevent you from having a barbecue outside, <laughs> they actually a very at, in, in large proportion prefer that we spend time getting rid of the mosquitoes that prevent us from having a barbecue outside. <laughs> um, there's actually a sociological analysis being done on that, and it's, it's fascinating. Um, because mostly we don't think of West Nile virus as being that big of a deal. And, and that's sort of a, um, a current expectation. It was a big deal when it first arrived in 1999. There were 60 cases in New York City. Everybody was kind of running around, not knowing what to do. But then, as usual, we kind of settled to the new normal. And basically, we have uh, West Nile virus across all of the United States. It took it uh, only about four or five years to go from New York to Washington State. So the entire country has now uh, tr a transmission every year of West Nile virus. But we're like, eh, well, no, it's not. <laughs> now, Lyme disease. That's a totally different story because Lyme disease has a group of, of advocates that have really have been trying to change the way we look at vector-borne diseases and vectors. So I'm happy that we, we sort of any point interrupt me. We're going to go through sort of quickly mostly the biology of the, of the arthropods, the, the mosquitoes, the ticks, and a little bit about kissing bugs. Um, so uh, just recently, oh, okay, I'm trying to forward. I'm going to have to point at it. Nope. Okay, so this is not working. Hmm. Mr. Uh, okay. <coughs> All right, so trying to forward. No, but it's not working here either. So this is frozen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so my next slide was going to show. <laughs> Leslie, thank you for the heads up. So my, my next slide was going to show the fact that we're now, as of this year, part of the Northeast. Center for Vector, um, the Northeast is Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases that had just been recently uh, funded by uh, the, the CDC um, when it realized that we had such small numbers that we're really training very few people in um, medical and veterinary entomology, which means the study of uh, organisms that have sort of articulated arthropods. They have external exoskeleton, and uh, um, unlike us, we have an internal uh, vertebrae that keep us sort of together. They have external exoskeletons, and so all these organisms, they basically have to shed to get, to get bigger. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of that biology. Um, we, the, the funding from CDC created five regional centers of excellence throughout the entire United States. The one in, in the Northeast is centered in Cornell. Uh, we're now part of it and started studying um, Started to, so the part of that project is really trying to um, increase doing research on, on vectors and vector-borne diseases, but also trying to train a next generation of medical and veterinary entomologists. Um, because very, ve there's actually very few people, there's, most people are not really aware of, uh, of the field, that there is a field with a lot of possibilities. There's lots <laughs> of, uh, of jobs, uh, not just as professors. There aren't that many jobs as professors, but lots of jobs in, in vector control, pest control, so, and they actually pay much better than um, sometimes you would expect. Just uh, my, my little uh, um, public <laughs> announcement. <laughs> so these are, these are good positions, and uh, um, they're a lot of fun. In fact, while I wait for this thing to fix, I was just uh, on Monday, thank you, on Monday, Monday through until about two hours ago, I was in southern New Jersey, actually in Cape May, looking for um, a new invasive um, species of, uh, of tick, um, not the one that Leslie will be talking about extensively, the Asian longhorn, but actually uh, the Gulf Coast tick that is a southern species that is slowly but surely making its way north. and. Uh, also looking for kissing <laughs> bugs. And I'll, I'll wrap all of this out uh, for, for all of us in a nice little bow. Uh, and the, the bow part of it is that really citizen science is critical for good surveillance of, uh, of vectors. And so you as master gardeners are really our eyes on the ground, iNaturalist, 
and uh, the bug guide. All of these are fantastic resources for entering information and we're really starting to realize what incredible potential that is. So hoping that this will now work, um, we got to start from the beginning. What is a disease vector? Lots of people get kind of stuck with this concept. What a vector? What's a vector? Is that a mathematical vector? Is it a, a viral <laughs> vector? And, and the term vector really just means transfer. And so um, in, in case of a disease vector, it's defined as uh, an organism, usually the smaller part, a smaller organism in, a, in sort of a three-part system where you have a larger host, the smaller host, that is the vector, and the pathogen. And so you have, in this case, an infected host and the, the, the vector will transport, will transmit the, the pathogen that will lead, that will, uh, may create or not create disease to a new host. So this person may or may not be, obviously is infected, may actually, may not be sick, meaning may not actually have any kind of, of uh, obvious signals of distress, <laughs> may, may, but it may still be infectious to the vector that then passes on this pathogen to an uninfected host. And so that's a disease vector. It's really relatively simple. Um, normally, uh, the pathogens that are considered to be uh, vector-borne are pathogens that cannot be transmitted person to person. So you can't, you know, you can't catch malaria by you know, ca you know, kissing or hugging or being next to somebody with malaria. You need a mosquito to actually pick up the pathogen with a specific uh, stage. And then the, the pathogen has to develop in the mosquito and then it becomes infectious to another person and is then transmitted to that other person with a, by a, 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 a bite. Um, there are, however, exceptions, and the, uh, the most uh, um, recent exception is Zika that actually is sexually transmitted. So that's pretty unusual. It's very unusual for a vector-borne disease, to a vector-borne pathogen to also be a contact uh, um, <laughs> pathogen, but, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. So bottom line, when somebody talks about vectors, you know, the center of vector biology, what's a vector? That's a vector, it's not. And so we're basically studying the, these guys and, and really sort of interactions between the pathogens and, uh, and the vectors and also um, how um, the biology, what makes them die, what, they, what makes them live because these, this is the critical step for this happening, for transmission to happen. If, the, if these were not, are not around, transmission of a vector-borne disease cannot happen unless there's an exceptional situation like with Zika. So let's start really from the right from the beginning because we tend to kind of dive in. I'm sure many of you have been at uh, mosquito talks where somebody starts talking about containers. I'll get there. But uh, the point is the beginning, you know, was only in the 1860s and 1870s that the concept that a disease was associated with a pathogen was really grasped and demonstrated by Louis Pasteur and, and Robert Koch. So the germ theory of disease happened, you know, was put together, formalized in the, in the late 19th century. And it was really in 1878, not that much longer after that, that Patrick Mason, because he was British and you do something cool, you become Sir Patrick, you got knighted. <laughs> so Sir Patrick Mason basically proposed that mosquitoes transmit lymphatic fluoriasis. Lymphatic fluoriasis is very deforming. It's a, it's a, a, a nematode. Uh, that basically um, uh, stops all the transmission of, um, uh, sort of, um, of lymphatic fluid and generates disfigurations like this. Um, they're, they're really big, you can see them, so you can squash a mosquito and you can see the filaria worm the same way that you could see the filaria worm on the wounds of that lady. So um, it, was, it was kind of an obvious first step for what would be transmitted, but to see something being transmitted by a mosquito. Um, then quickly after that, uh, Smith and Kilbourne were able to demonstrate that a tick transmitted a protozoan kind of r related to, to malaria. Um, it was trans transmitted by the cattle tick. Um, and then the, the big number in 1897, Ronald Ross, 21st of August, Mosquito Day, um, proposed <laughs> that mosquitoes transmit um, the, the protozoan agents of malaria. There's a bit of a big back and forth. The, the poor guy actually wasn't very good at mosquitoes. He had the wrong mosquito, the wrong malaria. He actually was look, working on uh, mal bird malaria, but he got the idea. Um, and then uh, Patrick Mason actually proved that mosquitoes transmitted malaria by, by really being in the, in the place where we could do this better because Italians had been proposing, they, they had done all the experiments, but there was malaria circulating in Italy. So it was really hard to prove that these poor volunteers that were you know, graciously agreeing to be bit by mosquitoes 
um, and became sick with malaria, it was really hard for them to be able to say, oh, but it was, there was no other way for them to become sick of malaria because malaria was being transmitted in Italy. What Patrick Mason did is that he obtained <coughs> mosquitoes that had been in the same room with people sick with malaria in Africa and sent the mosquitoes to the UK where there was no malaria transmission and demonstrated that people would get malaria in the UK where volunteers that couldn't possibly have been exposed to malaria became <coughs> sick. Impossible experiments to do now. <laughs> <laughs> no way. So God, things have gotten a little nicer, but kind of a little harder for us. But uh, it's OK. I can deal with that. But in you know, that concept, the, the final one, in 1900, Walter Reed um, demonstrated and, and killed volunteers in the process, demonstrated that uh, Aedes, albopic, uh, Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, transmits yellow fever. And so demonstrating that uh, this was some, an idea that Carlos Finlay, a Cuban uh, physician, had proposed before. Um, after the, the germ theory of disease and after Patrick Mason had proposed that mosquitoes transmitted filaria. So once this idea kind of came, suddenly all these people were, were associating pathogens <coughs> with mosquitoes and, and ticks. So it was uh, uh, quite a really fertile uh, field. Now you notice that um, yellow fever is a virus. It took over 60 years longer to actually determine what the, the pathogen was. But understanding that it was a mosquito that transmitted yellow fever in 1900 meant that by 1904, four years, we had actually basically eradicated yellow fever from Louisiana, from Cuba, and from the Panama Canal. <laughs> and that's allowed the Panama Canal to be built because without being able to, so these are mosquitoes, and that's where we're gonna get to the containers. <laughs> these are container mosquitoes. So the Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, is, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is actually an African species that only breeds, only lays eggs in small containers. Um, anything between like, you know, bucket size to something even smaller. That's how they get transported across the world. And so once this was realization that this mosquito transmitted yellow fever, and that was it, that's how you got the transmission made, people started oiling, because there were no insecticides in 1900. People would oil the waters and use arsenic to kill the larvae and literally paid people to go around and slap adult mosquitoes in the walls of the, these are, these are mosquitoes that are biting you in the house, um, just literally just killing them and we're able to control yellow fever. So it's not complicated. It's just that there's, it's, it's a little bit like, I always think of yellow fever or all these diseases, Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, is a little bit like the, the giant patch of garbage in the middle of the Pacific. There's nothing inherently complicated about a giant patch of, gar of, gar of garbage. It's just that it's so big that it's really hard to address as uh, to, to get rid of it. And it really is going to take everybody to be able to get rid of the giant patch of garbage in the middle of the Atlantic and also to get rid of yellow fever and dengue and chikungunya and uh, Zika. Okay, so we've, we've gone through a, you know, a shot in the past. Now to reality. So the number of species of major arthropods, remember arthropods, that's what entomology means, um, articulated limbs, there's two main groups, the insects and the arachnids. The insects have things like you know, sucking lice, chewing lice, bed bugs, kissing bugs, midges, mosquitoes, the big diptera. Diptera means two wings. So the, the, the diptera are very mobile because two wings is really, makes it really easy to fly. So they're really good at getting blood. So these are just the groups of species that will get blood at some point in their lives to, to, uh, to obtain nutrition. Usually it's the female that needs to do that so they can lay eggs. That's true of the insect, uh, but not always. Kissing bugs have to get uh, blood meals from every single stage. So in the diptera, it's usually the females that need a blood meal. In the midges, mosquitoes, sand flies, black flies, miscellaneous flies, you know, the, the guys that were just nailing me yesterday, the green-eyed flies. Um, so they, they need, they're being good mothers, uh, um, miscellaneous <laughs> flies and fleas. And then in the arachnids, so the, related to spiders, there's an entire group of acarides, so hard ticks and soft ticks, uh, that, will, that also need to get uh, blood meal. And in this case, they need a blood meal for every stage, the larva to the nymph, the nymph to the adult, uh, they, just, they just don't feed on anything else. They only feed on blood. So you're seeing the numbers of species, about 17,000 insects and roly 40, 40 some thousand species of, of uh, arachnids, uh, acari, just acari, 
the spiders don't feed on blood. So actually, some spiders will feed on mosquitoes that fed on blood. So technically, <laughs> they're kind of feeding on blood. Uh, it's actually a really interesting, I, uh, it's a cool field. Um, but the uh, uh, but point is, there's a lot of, so there's about you know, 60,000 species or so that need a blood meal. Fortunately, only a really a small, small number of species feed on us, us humans. Uh, most species have a specific you know, group of organisms, be it a, a, a possum or a, um, a, a, or a, a primate. Or th th so really, we're kind of a recent species, and we really don't have that many species that are sort of think of us as, well, we could get a blood meal from, from that human. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're, because there's so much of us, we're increasing the number of species that are starting to recognize us as a source of blood. And for the very few species, and that's where the kind of bottom line on this is, the handful of species that, that recognizes us, we've been very good at mul multiplying them by keeping them close to home. We're breeding them in our containers, they're developing in our containers where there are no predators, and so they get to really large numbers. And literally, all these diseases I keep saying, dengue, chikungunya, zika, yellow fever, there's really two species of mosquitoes, of mosquitoes, out of these 40,000 species that do all the transmission. And if you control those two, you basically be done with, uh, with those particular viruses. So um, it's that some, sort of an important <laughs> message, is that there is a lot out there, could be more, uh, 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 um, recognizing us, but right now we really just have a few species that we have to address, and we are seeing an increase, and I'm sure Alvaro showed um, pictures like this, we're seeing an in, uh, increase in, in vector-borne diseases. This is a, actually, at this point, relatively old paper. I just like that blue, it's a pretty. And then we have sort of more recent, this is 2016, when uh, the big epidemic of Zika happened. And, and so we're, we're seeing these, these busts, and, and dengue is continuing to stay high. It went down, but actually now it's gone up again. So we are seeing increases in vector-borne diseases. Why are we seeing that? I mean, we had a lot of vector-borne diseases. We had malaria in Europe. We had malaria right here, and we had yellow fever epidemics right here. We sort of dealt with that, a lot of that. Um, we thought we're kind of out of the woods. We, we started telling people, don't go to medical entomology because we got insecticized, we got discovered. Um, and, and that's part of the reason we don't have that many people in the field, now that we're starting to need more people. But a, so the, the thing is, we, 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 this part of that idea, like how do species start to recognize us as a, a source of blood, is that everything basically starts at a, as an inzootic cycle, meaning in the animals. I mean, technically we're an animal too, but we can pretend to put everything as dumb animals, and then we are the demics, the people. So anything in, that is inzootic or epizootic, inzootic means is normally circulating in animals like primates or birds or uh, small mammals or whatever. And if it's epizootic, it means it's epidemic in animals or birds or other or, or mammals or birds, etc. So in this case, you get uh, epizootic cycles when, for example, our livestock starts to interact with um, the, say you, you build a farm, you clear the entire forest, now you have pigs or chickens or um, horses or whatever in that area, and the mosquitoes that originally would only bite mammal, uh, sorry, primates, or only bite birds, start biting some of this, uh, these animals that are close to us. Some, usually there's a, just a few species that will do that, and then um, those species, because we're living right next to these guys, start recognizing us as a, a source of blood, start biting us, the pathogen gets transmitted to humans, and then in some cases we have mosquitoes that are completely adapted to urban environments, like the yellow fever mosquito, or the Asian tiger mosquito, or the house mosquito. Um, and these mosquitoes only <coughs> live in urban environments, I mean, domestic environments. And in that case, you can have transmission cycles that are completely just epidemic, just endemic in people, um, and, and epidemic because they're increasing in numbers. So for example, um, so a situation like the, the yes, uh, West Nile virus is actually a mosquito that is mostly a bird biting mosquito that um, became infected with a, a pathogen, West Nile virus. It, this is a pathogen that really is a, it's a bird disease. It's a bird pathogen. But this mosquito will infect the birds and every once in a while will bite. This is actually an invasive species brought in here with us, will bite people, and so transmits the pathogen to people. We're dead in a host. We cannot infect, even somebody really sick with West Nile virus cannot infect a mosquito 
So we're mostly um, sort of, uh, you know, side effects, uh, uh, you know, whatever the word is for, um, uh, so we're, we're really not much, we're not really part of the West Nile virus cycle. We just, we can die of it or can have sequelae from it uh, without really much can be done because you cannot control the pathogen in the birds. On the other hand, if you have something like, um, so you have something like uh, yellow fever virus, dengue virus, chikungunya virus, or, or Zika viruses, these viruses are only circulating between people and the mosquitoes that are associated with people. These are mosquitoes that bite people 40, 50, 60, 70, sometimes 100% of the time. They're, they're in people's houses, only bite people. And so these kinds of cycles are actually easier to control than something like West Nile virus. Because in this case, you can put, you can have the person going to um, quarantine or be at home with windows mm -hmm. and, and windowed screens and, and uh, no contact with mosquitoes, and you remove that source of transmission from circulation. So we've had an epidemic of West Nile virus that was unstoppable. We basically did nothing about that, that epidemic. It started in New York and vip, just went across like a wildfire. But there was just nothing we could do, really. I mean, we, we keep trying to kill mosquitoes, but the birds are infected, and the mosquitoes will find the birds, and then there'll be enough mosquitoes in our backyards that they'll come and bite us, and we have transmission happening. Thankfully, West Nile virus is not terribly pathogenic. It's not really virulent. Um, when this, and, and this is actually a classical case because it can be quite virulent to the birds. Its circulation is mostly in the birds. We're just side effects of it. On the other hand, something like yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, or Zika, are just circulating in humans. So the amount of virulence of these forms actually depends on the demographics of particular areas. And we know there's been a lot of variability in um, the sort of virulence of these, of these forms, of these viruses. Now you can also have, so you're seeing basically, you, we, both, all of these diseases were originally in zootic pathogens. I mean, uh, Zika was in the Zika forest in Africa. Chikungunya also came from uh, Africa. Dengue is an Asian uh, virus and yellow fever is also African. And at some point it just sh jumped over out of from, um, in the all cases, a primate by, because a, a mosquito that bit a primate became infected at some point, infected a human. It's, these pathogens are infectious to these domestic mosquitoes and now you have a um, epidemic cycle. So these kinds of spillovers are basically has been happening uh, on, on a recurring basis, in current, in increasing race basis. We used to only have yellow fever, then dengue came al along, then chikungunya was around 2000, 2001 to 2010, and then Zika in 2010 to 2016. And so we've been sort of having these new waves of, of things <coughs> coming through. The, the plat du jour, I always wonder what's gonna be the thing this summer. Um, but now you can have endemic cycles, something like human malaria is always continuously being transmitted in Africa. And so this is a complicated pathogen because the, the mosquitoes are local mosquitoes, endemic mosquitoes, the people are living there. It's really hard to break these kinds of endemic cycles, much easier to break something like this where it's only in the house. The mosquitoes are only breeding in people's backyards. And then of course you have the endemic cycles of still to this day of lymphatic fluoriasis. So what I've sort of all, all told you here is that these invasive mosquitoes are the primary drivers of all these diseases that we're worried about right now. So <coughs> it's, it's uh, um, you know, all of these. I've I just told you all of this. So the three mosquitoes, the, the three big guys, are the Asian tiger mosquito that has is a black and white mosquito with this sharp white um, stripe down. It's really easy to see. And, and trust me on this one. I know everybody's going to laugh, <laughs> but the next time you're getting bit by a mosquito, do not squish the mosquito until you identify the mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> because th the moment you notice you've been bit by a mosquito, all damage has been done. That mosquito is already injected. The, the big difference, we'll talk about ticks in a minute. Ticks are like slow motion things. It's just they're doing there. In fact, I'll make, I'll make this, uh, the, the, the pair above the, 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 the hare and, uh, and the tortoise, the tortoise and the hare. The hare are the mosquitoes. They get in there and they quickly figure out where, and then they inject these anticoagulants and, and anti-inflammatory, and if there's a pathogen, the pathogens into you, and then you go, ah, oh, I got bit by a mosquito. It game over. There's no point to, to kill that mosquito at, until you identify, then kill it. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, release the mosquito. Don't do that. I mean, they just fed on you. They're gonna lay eggs. So 
You want to kill it, but first go, okay, what species is that? Ah, okay. Then you kill it, because then you know, at this point, you know what your odds are. If it's a, if it's a brown mosquito that looks like this, um, it's completely, most, and this is my favorite mosquito. I've been working on this mosquito for 30 years. Totally boring, completely brown mosquito. This is the mosquito that at night goes <laughs> that's Kulik. That's a, that's, there's a northern house mosquito and a southern house mosquito, a temperate mosquito and a tropical mosquito, been moved by people all over the world, been going around forever. Um, these mosquitoes are the West Nile virus vectors. See, if you get bit by something that looks like this, I wouldn't be worried about West Nile virus. <coughs> and in fact, around here, I wouldn't be worried about anything besides the fact that we shouldn't have these mosquitoes here. They're invasive. I should have done something about it. I need to clean my backyard or my neighbor's by backyard, or my community backyard, because that's why these are here. These guys have been around here for uh, probably with the Santa Maria or something. It just came in the, in the cargo hold. That's how these mosquitoes got here. Same thing for this. This is the yellow fever mosquito. A little, maybe a little later, um, these may have, this came with the traffic of slaves from Africa, so did, so did yellow fever. These really should not be called yellow fever mosquitoes, and common names are always an interesting story because these are also the dengue fever mosquito, the chikungunya mosquito, the Zika virus mosquito. So calling them yellow fever mosquito, I had this conversation with somebody in, in, in uh, India where they don't have yellow fever, and that's one of the big mysteries of medical entomology. They have the mosquito, but they don't have yellow fever, and I wanted some specimens from, from India because I wanna, I'm a molecular biologist. I wanted to do some genetics because I wanted to understand why they didn't have yellow fever. And it's like, no, we don't have yellow <coughs> fever mosquitoes here. I'm like, no, you, you do, you do. The species, Evie's aegypti, is present. And they're like, no, no, because we don't have yellow fever. <laughs> I'm like, well, but they have dengue and chikungunya and Zika. But, you know, so communication, this is the Evie's aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, or the dengue mosquito. Okay, so these three mosquitoes are basically transmitting the, the diseases we're currently worried about in terms of epidemics. Um, now, so again, I must make sure we're all on the same page. The typical mosquito life cycle is the, the female lays eggs on the surface of the water or on some sort of surface of a, of a container. In this case, it's a Culex mosquito that lay, actually lays the egg rafts as a, um, as, a, as a raft. There's like 150 to 200 eggs like vertically and they all hatch at the same time and it's sort of kind of cool. Have a, it kind of opens a little, a little lid. The, the larvae have a, a um, little horn that kind of pops the, 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 the egg case. They all come out. And then you have first in star, second in star, third in star, and fourth in star. There's always four in stars uh, in all mosquito species. And then this is a pupa, and then here's the adult. The adult sort of kind of gets itself out of the, of the water. The, the, just sort of the, the, this, the pupa, which is the cocoon, just opens up. And this adult, and this is really cool to see. I mean, it's a great, uh, uh, I like, it's a great like a uh, um, high school or uh, a middle school kind of project, just give a, a student uh, 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 some larvae and let them become pupae and then observe them just coming out. Because it's, it's cool, it's physics and it's biology and it's, uh, it's a really interesting project. Um, and, and, but, and this is a Culex mosquito, a typical uh, 80s mosquito actually lays eggs on the, on, the, on the container. So it doesn't lay it on the surface of the water. It's actually on the container side. And it's above, usually abo it's always above the water level because the, the, and this is what the eggs look like. This is actually on um, germination paper that you're probably familiar with. This is what we use for, uh, can we put this on the germination paper that you use for germinating seeds. We use it for mosquitoes to lay eggs on them. Um, and then you can put these in uh, just underwater and they all hatch. The reason the females lay the eggs above the water line is because when it rains and the container fills up with water, the low oxygen pressure is the signaling for the eggs to hatch because it's a signal of, ah, more water. So there's enough time for enough water for them to develop from first in star, second, third, fourth, pupa, and then adults. Takes in the summer about five days, actually seven days, um, to, for them to go from the egg all the way to, to adults. Um, so basically if you change your, your, water, your, your bird bath water once a week, you're good. Um, that's, we actually have t-shirts that say uh, water plus seven days equal mosquito. So, <laughs> that. so it's, that's kind of the, the clue. But the other thing is that people say tip and toss. Tip and toss works for Culex because the moment you empty the water, the egg rafts just go with it. 
but it won't work for 80s because the eggs are still on the side of the container and they were above the water anyway. Um, so if you just put the container back and it rains, it, you ha you're, gonna, you're gonna have, the, the eggs are still there, they're gonna hatch, you're gonna develop. So you really literally have to scrub the inside of these containers if you really wanna keep that container sitting there accumulating water. So, um, so there's a, and these eggs in some cases can be almost completely dry. Um, the Aedes albopictus is not completely, it is Egypti, the yellow fever mosquito can dry completely, it's great because you can keep them in the lab, you just keep these little, these little paper things of eggs, you know, you need eggs? Here, you can put it, start the experiment, it's really a nice experimental setting. Now, is this a mosquito? Good, awesome, good audience, all right, why not? Yeah, it doesn't have the, the business end. <laughs> this, this is missing, the proboscis is missing, so this is a, Leave these guys alone. They're they're really cool. Um, the people tend to kill them. Oh, sorry, you can't see it, but it's a crane fly, hawk fly. They they like they look like gigantic mosquitoes, and they sort of they're slow moving. By definition, that is not a mosquito. Um, so the these guys are really easy to ki to kill. They're harmless. They're they're herbivores, um, and um, they actually the larvae kind of help with the composition of the soil. So um, so always look for the the business end. For bosses missing. And you can see these are diptera, they have two wings, and the second set of, of wings is actually right here, modified as little, look like little maracas. They use it for balance. These are really fast, they, they really move really quickly. You can have mosquito upside down. I mean, they're, they really are very fast, which is why um, they're so successful. It's also why bats are not a particularly good eater of mosquitoes, and I hate to break that to you. Uh, but I'd love to have them be, we've done studies, they're good at eating stink bugs, so if you're worried about stink bugs, they'll eat stink bugs, but we have not found a significant amount of mosquito DNA in their, in their guano, which is how we, we did the study. Um, now, it's just a, um, making sure that, could you just click on the screen, make sure that that starts. Just so we're all on the same page, I have a little video. I, I, I like to, to so show you, whoops, no, next, next one. I, I can do that for you. I'll change, okay. I'll change this, and then actually maybe I can just yeah, click yeah. now, now. Yeah. Can you just click on the screen? Yeah. Just click. Yeah, oh, that's it. All right, so this is what you should be looking for. You should kill these guys at this stage. So these are larvae, and uh, you see the suspension feeders, because you see them, like, you see that? Just They're just basically suspended. They're removing all bacteria, little fungi, protozoa from the water. And uh, this is the, they're, they're not aquatic organisms. They need the, the siphon to be able to breed. So they're coming up to, the, to get air like somebody, like a snorkel. Mm -hmm. um, can you actually go sure. back and do it again? Back again? Yeah. Um, so they're, they're sitting there and that's why the oil works because you, you, you're basically preventing them from breeding, you're suffocating them. Now I don't, I, there are now new, this monofil, there's like a, these the new products that create like a little film on the surface of the water um, they're better than oil, because oil will kill everything. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you, all you have is a bucket, you know, there's better ways to, to, to deal with these guys. But they're, they're, they're getting air, and then these are the pupae, or so-called wrigglers, and they have, they look like Shrek, you know, the, the little, <laughs> so that's also their air horns, they, they're getting air. So, mm -hmm. so um, these, are, these are, again, suspension feeders. Um, these are Culex, they have a big siphon the 80s have kind of a shorter blunt siphon. Um, that's an easy way to tell them apart. You can see these guys in, in, you know, in any container. And at this point, you know, the oil that will we'll deal with it, but also BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis, Israel lenses, like dunk. That's a, it's a great product because it really um, it has a toxin, is only activated inside the gut, the very high pH gut of a mosquito or a black fly or a midge. So that you could basically, one of us, we could eat BTI and really wouldn't do anything because we have acidic guts that will not activate the toxins. There's also four toxins to BTI, so it's, uh, there, are no, there is currently no evidence of resistance to, to BTI, while there is evidence of resistance to pretty much every other insecticide. So it's a, it's a best thing, don't have containers in your backyards <laughs> where that can accumulate water. Second best thing, empty them every week. Don't forget to do that. Um, and then third best thing, use an insecticide like BTI to, to control them. All right, so I talked about invasive species. I just wanna quickly go over. This is the, the yellow fever mosquito. It's really high, very easily recognized, although this, this is a little bit washed out. It looks like a banjo. It has these white 
white, white br bands on the side, and then two, a two string bang banjo is the easy jibki. There's two strings and then two lines in the middle, black and white. This mosquito is originally from um, Africa. It's thought that a population became isolated with a desertification with this part of the, the, the Sahara, um, and then moved to slave trade into the Americas, and actually from the Americas moved actually to Hawaii in 1892, and then across to, to Asia, which is potentially part of the reason Asia actually doesn't have yellow fever. So there's some really interesting sort of historical reasons why, um, why there's sort of variability in, in transmission. Um, there are populations underground, actually in Washington DC, just recently a paper showed what seemed to be a ma maintenance of genetic diversity, which means the populations are remaining there over the years, potentially by going underground. So the tropical mosquito, but you're starting to see them expanding north as it gets warmer, but also they can go underground and starting to exploit things like sewers. Um, it is Albopictus mentions, remember that white stripe? Really easy to see. Totally, but plus, it's the mosquito that is biting you during the day around here. Unless you live right next to the salt marsh where you're probably going to get also bit by the salt marsh mosquitoes. And we'll talk a bit more about diversity of mosquitoes. Um, the mosqu the Albopictus has both temperate and tropical populations. And <laughs> interestingly, at around the same time, they both started expanding, uh, although the um, Arab pirates apparently had introduced uh, Albopictus into uh, Madagascar in the 16th century. But it was really much more recently, 1896 into Hawaii, everything gets into Hawaii. All these mosquitoes are present. Every invasive species is now present in Hawaii. Um, and uh, uh, the 1962 went across the Wallace's line. Then 1972, uh, the Torres Strait between uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, Australia. 1979 into Albania, and it's been expanding in Albania. So these dates are just first, the first occurrence, and then they just expand in those areas. So Europe since 1979, um, 1983 in Venezuela, and then at the same year it was detected in Harris County in Texas and also in Brazil. Uh, this is a tropical speed form, and this is a temperate form. In so. And then, and then very disturbingly, it actually got to Africa. So again, this is an Asian species, and Africa does not need another mosquito. Um, so in 1991, in Gabon, and so it's been expanding. So there's actually a few other species. I've been working on Japonicus, a very, very cold weather mosquito for a while, but I'm not gonna tell the full story. Point is, we have now these, mostly these three. Japonicus is starting to become domesticated, has been moving with people. But basically, these are the mosquitoes we're mostly concerned that are so how did this happen? Well, this happened. Containers happened. So the, these mosquitoes are originally already container mosquitoes. There are things like bamboo mosquitoes, like little containers, or tree hole mosquitoes. You know, trees sometimes get like a hole in the tree. Tree hole mosquitoes are, these are the, they're, they're African and Asian tree hole mosquitoes. We started making containers and then we started moving the containers across the world. And this is how these, these mosquitoes, first this guy and then this guy, and now more recently these two, this 1985 in US, 1998 in the US, actually Ocean County here in New Jersey, first place was detected. Um, of course, then we went from something like this to something like this. Um, so the trade of used tires and then to something like this, and, and that's part of the reason. And so we've developed all these underground tunnels where it's always warm underground. So even a tropical species can survive underground. And then we did this, insecticide resistance. So that really has changed things. And so this is a, um, a development obviously since the 1950s when we started uh, using chemical insecticides and we've seen an incurring trend, it takes about a year or two now for insecticide, to the insecticide resistance to develop once it starts. So this is the worldwide ship traffic, a little picture, um, and then uh, the air traffic. Um, so this is one year. So we really sort of, there's, it's, we need to be more careful, but I really, I, I would love your, your, your input on how we can manage and modify uh, the movement of, of traffic, it's commerce, but then we're bringing all these invasive species. Mosquitoes are just an example of them and not even that common. Wow, this is really washed out. But um, this is the current distribution of Aedes aegypti in the US, so it's all the way up um, into parts of, uh, uh, this is Maryland out here, we're somewhere in there, um, here. 
and this is with Albopictus. So the uh, so species we're kind of starting. You're getting more and more north. So that, those are the two primary ones. See here the two two string banjo, <coughs> and the the black and white striped, um, and then the Culex is just this brown mosquito with no stripes whatsoever. And then the the main thing we tell people is invasive mosquitoes are container mosquitoes. Protect yourself and your family by getting rid of containers. Um, we keep saying get rid of trash, but the fact is what we do realize, and tires, but the fact is that a lot of the things we consider things we need to have in our yards are the containers. So it's not just get rid of trash, it's get rid of anything. And one of, one of the things that uh, um, I noticed is that this is someone that thought, I'm not using this container, I'm going to put it upside down, that way I'll limit the amount of, of uh, container habitat. This area right here is full of larvae. <laughs> because uh, uh, unfortunately, container makers, plastic molders, didn't realize that mosquitoes are a big problem. You, not only do you get mosquitoes here, but you get mosquitoes in that little lip that goes all the way around. So you really, you, you to treat, you have to put it indoors. Just putting it upside down is not going to make it happen. And even more um, insidious is this. So we actually, this paper was, ended up being called uh, um, Hidden in Plain Sight. It took us three years to realize that the mosquitoes, we kept, you know, what, what's going on? Why are there all these albopictus coming from? This is here in New Jersey. And then realize that on the inside, each one of these little accordions, there's enough, enough water for the larvae to develop. The trick with this is not only not using the accordion variety, is also to position it so that the water does not accumulate. And please do not, we've seen them that go across the entire backyard, the entire thing. have taken hundreds of larvae. And it's actually only Albopictus that will lay eggs in here. Hardly any other species of mosquito will lay eggs in these kinds of very small little containers. They lay one egg at a time to, so they can just basically do bad hedging where they put an egg there, another one there, so to sort of spread the risk. And so they can handle small little containers of water. A Culex mosquito, where it lays 200 eggs, would never lay eggs in something like that because there's not going to be enough water. And their entire progeny is going to be right there in that one container. So they're the ones who lay eggs in abandoned swimming pools, catch basins. So they're much bigger kinds of containers. That's where Culex lay eggs. And that takes me to the, to the next slide, which is, so before West Nile virus happened, mosquito control was actually invented in New Jersey by my predecessor, John Smith, a professor of entomology at Rutgers University that realized that salt marsh mosquitoes, which is what this is referring to, um, really require, um, they, they only lay eggs in, in places with no fish, basically no water. And when you have these big spring tides, they, it gets flooded. And, and when the water recedes, it's, the water stays in these depressions for about five days or so. And that's enough time for the mosquito eggs to go from eggs to adults. You get these waves of adult mosquitoes coming out. And what, what Dr. Smith figured out was, if I were to just ditch, this area and basically make a, a little connection between the, this, these pools and, the, and the, the coast, the shore, the water will come out faster. And as long as the water is not there for five days, uh, the mosquitoes will, the larvae will die out and, and be killed and we're done. Um, and that was what he was able to demonstrate. He then talked to the New Jersey legislature and the New Jersey constitution has the law that you have to have a professor of medical and veterinary entomology at Rutgers University there's an Office of Mosquito Control Commission downtown, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, and there's 21 county mosquito control programs. In each one of your counties, there's a mosquito control program that will come to your house for free and will tell you, um, you know, your, is your problem something we can handle? Like uh, um, uh, you're close to a salt marsh and we need to be better uh, stewards of that, of that area. Or, and this is where we're going next, um, is there something else going on? So the Mosquito Control Commissions, all 21 of them, there's only now four left. A lot of the programs, were they're still there, but they're now part of the health department or roads and transportation. Um, they're, they were basically developed to deal with community problems, with, with mosquito populations that are breeding in such large environments, I mean, laying eggs in such uh, large areas that no one person can take care of them. So things like the, the salt marsh mosquito or the, the uh, and actually I have a picture in here. So, um, so here, the salt marsh mosquito <laughs> is sort of this gold mosquito with striped legs. And then this is the freshwater floodwater mosquito, which is the freshwater 
not equivalent because these guys are basically dependent on the tide. These are just dependent on the on rain. When you have a, the kind of rain events we've been having, you have these big um, uh, clouds of Edis vac sands, the freshwater floodwater mosquito that just comes out from eggs that were laid in often in pretty just mud, no, no real water. Um, and this is another local mosquito, Edis trisuriatus, is the tree hole mosquito, our tree hole mosquito. They don't, acu they don't they really get to many numbers. There aren't that many tree holes. So they, they're really only laying eggs up there. They're, they're, they're feeding on birds. They're, they're up there in the, in the, envir in the, in the trees, and they're kind of self-limiting. Um, there's lots of predators in those, in those uh, tree holes. So these are native species. These can get pretty large numbers. This is why mosquito control was developed uh, for community level control. When West Nile virus hit, Culex is the, is, the, is the vector. And Culex are laying eggs, as I just said, in abandoned swimming pools and catch basins. The, so large containers. So um, the, the reason we had to, um, seriously? Oh my God, okay, all right, I'll go fast. <laughs> the reason we had to basically um, develop, uh, uh, so we, we th th there was in 2000, there was this run around trying to figure out what to do because these are now mosquitoes that are breeding communal areas but much more, limit, much, much more developed uh, in, in the middle of, of the town. Um, so a lot of the mosquito programs got a big uh, spike in funding from the CDC to start controlling Aedes mosquitoes, um, sorry, Culex mosquitoes. But then when the Asian tiger mosquito showed up, these mosquitoes are coming out of everybody's backyard or most people's backyard. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way that mosquito um, control can go to everybody's backyard. And so we have the Culex mosquito coming in here and now Aedes albopictus. <coughs> so what we started doing, what I started doing is a program called <laughs> Citizen Acts, Citizen Action Through Science. Not Citizen Science because Citizen Science is citizens helping the scientists Citizen acts as a scientist helping the citizens. So you have a problem, you reach out to a scientist, and we develop, and my expertise is mosquitoes, so I help develop programs for controlling mosquitoes. This is Arlene, um, a retired music teacher that just really got a kick out of controlling mosquitoes. We, we develop big community, uh, about a thousand, a thousand home community, and we were able to demonstrate a reduction in about 80% in bites uh, of the Asian tiger mosquito by uh, having a, a, or a program where using traps and also using information so people don't have containers in their backyard. Now, I have lots of other things to tell you, but I'm out of time, so <laughs> I am gonna stop right here, okay? So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to talk to you about other things. Thank you.